U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having American agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. U.S. Farm Report now presents a look at agriculture and its effect on the economy with some of our nation's outstanding leaders. This is Barney Arnold in Louisville, Kentucky, reporting for U.S. Farm Report. Our guests on this occasion are three gentlemen from the National Farmers Organization. We're delighted to have Mr. George Stiles immediately across from me here. He's state chairman of uh, the Kentucky State NFO from Howardstown, Kentucky. And uh, Mr. Earhart Pinkston from Sergeant Bluff, Iowa. I finally got that located right there, Earhart. National Vice President. And on my immediate right, Mr. Glenn Utley from Fort Branch, Indiana, National Director from the Hoosier State. Gentlemen, welcome to our program, and uh, we'd like to start this out here by getting uh, your comments, uh, Glenn, if you would, uh, about this uh, big convention that we have here in Louisville. What do you think about it? Well, Barney, I think this is the best convention that we've ever had in the organization, and I think the delegates are going home here and go to work and be ready for some action. Uh, George, I think you and your committees, uh, Earl and the boys, have really done a fine job on the arrangements. I, that's been my casual observation. Thank you, Barney. Earl did most of that, I have to admit. <laughs> Earl has been real good, and I've heard a lot of real good compliments from the people of Louisville and our delegates. Mr. Pinkston, would you concur? Yes, very much so. The Kentucky boys are inclined to be a little bit modest, <laughs> except when they're in Iowa talking about Kentucky. <laughs> then they get out of hand. <laughs> but I think they did do a terrific job. And from the attitude that I pick up around the convention, they are pleased with this site here. And most certainly, we as officers are very, very highly pleased with the convention. There's no question it's been one of the finest that I have ever attended. And I'm literally amazed at the unity and the determination to solve this problem once and for all. The theme of your convention is no price, no production. And uh, from the reaction that I get from the crowd out there, they mean just exactly that, don't they think? And no doubt about it. <laughs> Maybe that's, that's what, what makes it such a good convention, and it, the facilities are wonderful. We're ready to go. All right. Let's, let's uh, go back into the background on this, and I'd like for you, Mr. Finkston, to give us the general agricultural economic picture as you see it today. Well, the, according to Carl Wilkins, who has made a lifetime study of the impact on American agriculture, on the economy of this nation. Uh, the raw materials, of course, are the basis of the nation's economy. In other words, uh, the raw materials from agriculture, from minerals, they're the same as the deposits in the bank. You don't make any deposits, you can't write checks indefinitely on it. But according to Mr. Wilkins, for every one dollar that is paid to American agriculture, that one dollar generates seven dollars of earned income by the time it gets through the entire economy. And actually an average of three dollars and sixty-four cents within the county in which it is produced. So when you shortchange agriculture or the American farmer, then for each dollar that you shortchange him, you rob the entire economy of seven dollars of earned income. And of course, when it doesn't come from that source, then it has to be made up in another way. It has to come from either taxes through government projects or through borrowed money. And we have reached the point where we have depleted our economy by shortchanging, by exploiting the producers of agricultural products, which is 70% of the nation's, uh, the basis of the nation's economy. Mr. Pinkston, I understand that uh, agricultural income is going to be down around 8 or 10% uh, this year compared with 1966 and that farm prices, farm income, is uh, less than it was 20 years ago. Now, this doesn't hardly seem possible, but uh, I guess it's true. That is, the, the uh, net income is way beyond, way below what it is. Farm income, the gross, is probably up, but we, we are producing so much, much more. So I'd like to take it to a little bit different way. The prices that we are receiving are less than they were at 20 years ago. 
The last official publication that I saw of the rate of parity, which means a fairness of prices related to other segments of the economy, was 74%, and that was last April. Well, since that time, just offhandedly, I'd say that wheat has dropped fully 50 cents a bushel, or 30%, perhaps. Uh, hogs have dropped uh, $5 a hundred to 6 and $7 a hundred. Cattle are declining. Corn, well, I guess I don't have to tell people in, in any area what's happened to there. It's below cost of production, and we haven't been at that in that kind of a position since the very heart of the Depression of 1934. There isn't a businessman in the United States, a professional man, or a working man anywhere that could retake the prices he received 20 years ago and pay today's high cost of living or high cost of operating. And the American farmer can't do it either. Our prices have climbed just the same as anyone else. I'm talking about our costs have climbed just the same as anyone else's mm -hmm. have. And we're not even receiving what we received 20 years ago. It's got to bankrupt the not only the American farmer, but the national economy. Of course, 20 years ago, we were in a sort of a uh, post-wartime economy. Well, when I'm talking about 20 years ago, I'm talking about from 1947 yeah. on, and we were quite oh, a yeah. ways past that war then. Yeah. But this is an important period because it is one of the period that I think is generally agreed on that all segments of the economy were in balance. So I think it is a proper com comparison, yeah. and they should have exactly the same ratio that they received then if they're going to be in, in, in balance. You can't exploit any segment of the economy, be it labor, industry, or anything else, without destroying the entire economy. And there's been a continuous exploitation of the American farmer for 15 years. Well, I, I'm, a, I'm a town boy, George, as you know now. I'm a country <laughs> boy. I don't know this economy, Barney. Well, what I was starting to say here, to bear out what Mr. Finkston said a while ago, if any other part of our economy had to get by on less than they were making 20 years ago, they'd be in pretty rough circumstances. I, I, for example, I'm making three times what I was making 20 years ago. I don't know whether I'm worth that much more to my firm or not, but uh, actually I am. Of course, it takes it all anyway to live, but uh, nevertheless... Uh, uh, Barney, I don't the, really don't think personal illustrations here, but I'm, I'm familiar with that. I'm not a good uh, economist like... Mr. Fankston, but in the early 40s, I started farming actually on my own. My dad helped me up until then. 3,000, uh, 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 600 bushel of corn at that time would buy a two-plow size tractor. Today, it will take four to 5,000 bushel of corn to buy that same two-plow size tractor. Gentlemen, uh, we have uh, cried in our milk long enough. I think what we want to do now is to tell what we're going to do to work ourselves out of this situation. Mm -hmm. From what you gentlemen say, it's obvious that something is going to have to happen here to give us a better farm income. And this is where we get into the principle of collective bargaining. That is uh, NFO's main theme and uh, the basis on which they are functioning. Glenn, uh, if, if you would give us uh, your uh, concept here of collective bargaining as it applies to the NFO principle. I'd appreciate it. Well, actually, Barney, uh, collective bargaining is uh, just more or less farmers bargaining together and selling together. This is collective bargaining. Yeah. Now, to get into our program, uh, we're starting out here from this convention, of course, of talking about grain and all commodities. Of course, our grain program, within the next few days, the boy's going to be back out there uh, pushing it hard. And we want to go into a holding action on this grain, as Mr. Staley made in his talk, not more than 40 days from now. And then, of course, the meat, the dairy, will be coming at the proper time. You have to gauge these things. Now, a holding action, which I would like to explain a little, uh, a lot of people say, well, they don't like this method of collective bargaining. They're going along with collective bargaining, but they don't like the method, they say, of NFO. Well, as uh, far as liking a holding action, no, I don't like it either. I don't think Mr. Finkson here does or Mr. Stiles. But this is what we have left to do. In other words, when you go in and sit down with processors and... What are you going to say when you come into them and say, well, now here, we've got to have a dollar and a half of corn for corn, or we've got to have three dollars for soybeans, or two dollars for wheat. We've got to have this or else, or else what? 
Now, this is what it amounts to in collective bargaining. We're going to deliver anyway? No. You've got to use this holding action. This is a tool that every segment of the economy uses, and we have given them plenty of chance, plenty of time here to do something, and if they won't, then we've got to do it some other way. This is all there is to it, Barney. Well, it, it actually amounts to nothing more than, uh, let's say, copying all business, all industry right. of this nation. They use the power of their production to enforce their price. Your automobile industry, how do they do it? They don't ask their customers what they want to pay for the, for the automobiles. They determine their price on the basis of what it costs them to produce that automobile. Then they tell their dealers, this is what you're going to pay or you don't get any automobiles. This is exactly what we're doing for the American farmer. We're putting him in, into a position where he becomes a businessman in marketing his production instead of a panhandler in the market, which he is now under the present conditions. George? Uh, I would like to say this. I wish, as I agree with Glenn, that we didn't have to do it. I don't think really the businessman likes to tell a person that he can't get it, but he has to use it or he wouldn't get it. He couldn't get a price for a suit of clothes if he didn't just tell him you can't get it without you paying. It's that simple to me. Well, we're used to it, you see, with the businessman. This way business has always been conducted. We're used to it. We think nothing about it. We don't even realize that's what he's doing to us. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll be no different in American agriculture once the farmer himself that's right. becomes right. the businessman that he should be pricing his own production. Who knows better than he does? As long as he's going to say, what'll you give me? How else can he hope to do, do you all think that, uh, I'm, I'm not saying it, I'm asking, do you think that it can be done without uh, the type of demonstration that we had when we had the recent, uh, relatively recent uh, milk holding action? Th th this was, uh, I'm not criticizing the method that was used there, but it did uh, leave uh, a, sort of a, 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 a bad connotation with some folks. Well, of course, it de would depend on a lot of things on what you mean. You can't do it without cutting off the production no more than the merchant can enforce his price without refusing to let any man who won't pay it have it. I think uh, the real reason why it seems so unusual to him is because the farmer's been like a bunch of sheep just coming along, being led and to slaughter by the Judas goats, you might say, the nation <laughs> over. And so it seems unusual when the man who's been so docile and such a sucker all his life finally bra braces his feet. I imagine it does seem unusual, but it's nothing more than what every business, every industry, every professional man, every working man that's in an organized group has always done. So it's just following the, the leaders, you might right. say. Uh, Glenn, now you mentioned the, uh, the grain holding action. This mm -hmm. is the uh, most yes. imminent thing. This yes. is going to come up, be coming up within It'll the next 40 days, as Mr. Staley said. Quick. All right, uh, just how would this work briefly? Well, what we're doing, uh, Barney, we're asking all of our members to uh, put as much of their crop, 50% of it or more, into a grain bank. This to start with, and this will be helped back here. It'll be off of the market. And then we have our arrangements, which we... Would this, be excuse me, would this be in Commodity Credit Corporation storage? No, no, no. This, would this not will be. be farm storage. All this right. will be stored on the farm. Of course, what we're coming when we go into this action here, it's just don't sell it, lock it up, all of it. That's what's going but, to count. But uh, this is what is going to count. Now, uh, this is what you've got to do. There is no other way. Okay, they got 50% of it in storage. Yeah, okay, yeah. what happens to it then? In other words, we're going to leave that set there until we can get a price for it, or at the end of the year, we may ship it overseas or something of that sort. But this is going to stay in this grain bank, as we're calling it, so right there, and that's that much taken off of the market. And what you have left here then, you have to bargain with, as well as what you have in your grain bank, too. Now, we can send it overseas maybe at the end of the year anyway, but not let it on this normal channel trade. Do we consider soybeans as a grain? Soybeans, wheat, All right. everything. What, what is your gold price for soybeans? Soybeans is $3. dollars dollar and a half for corn, $2 for wheat. Soybeans are under 2 and a half right now They're on the market. They're under 2 and a half right now. <laughs> All right. Uh, we, they say we're going to have close to a billion bushel soybean crop this year. You That's think right. you're going to be able to find a market? We've got a lot of competition in the oil 
business internationally? Well, we have some competition in the oil. We've heard a lot about sunflower oil the last while, but yeah. one of the reasons the sunflower oil is uh, taking over was because the government pulled out of selling soybean oil uh, here some time back through Public Law 480. So, uh, uh, sure, we're going to have some competition, but the only reason that the foreign buyers are buying grain, oil, or anything from us is because they have to have it. This is what they're buying it. So they're going to have to pay for it just the same as our own local buyers are going to have to pay for it. In other words, the idea involved here is get a full fair price well, for right. everything that is needed. Why let a one or two percent that might be beyond what moves conveniently destroy the price on all of it. This is what has happened. So the idea is get a full fair price for everything that's needed in the normal market channels. And then that last percentage point or two, if it's there, then put that out on world market or at whatever it'll bring. But get a full fair price like every businessman does. He don't start cutting at the first of the year because he might have some something left over at the end of the year. He gets it first and then sells out on a sale what he has left. Gentlemen, I think we pursued the uh, Green Bank idea considerable now. Uh, would this be used any way, uh, Glenn, in connection with the uh, feed grains program? Or do you think that you can get along without the government programs that we have in existence and uh, operate your program uh, the way that you'd like to? Well, there's no question in time, uh, Barney, we, we hope to operate this without government programs. I don't think that uh, any farmer really wants a government program, but however, you can't do away with them either at this point. Mm -hmm. And this grain bank will not uh, be working with the government program. This is our own program. Yes, I, I understood and, uh, that. Actually, what it works in with, Barney, is our surplus disposal program, mm -hmm. in other words. Uh, this, I think, to have a bargaining organization, you have to have a surplus program with it. And to me, I'm pretty proud of it. I know time doesn't permit here to go into it and explain it, but uh, uh, in other words, uh, two or three percent of production has been holding our prices down, and this we've got to get away from. I, I think uh, we should uh, recognize one thing here, that the consumers uh, are, I'm thinking about the people in town now primarily, are, are nervous about what you all are proposing to do. They are nervous that uh, it's going to increase their food budget considerable. And uh, they think that they're already paying about all that they can afford to for food. I'd like to hear your comments on this. Well, they are paying less, a smaller percentage of their income today than they ever have in history. Yeah, about 10 years ago, possibly just a little bit longer, they were paying 26% of their income for groceries, for food. They're down now to about 17%. So they are getting the biggest bargain that they ever got in history. But uh, I can see why they would be jumpy about paying for their food bill. I don't like to pay my grocery bill either. I don't like to pay my gasoline bill. I don't like to pay a higher price for cars. But uh, the automobile industry didn't ask me whether I wanted to. They just told me I was going to. So the consumer gets a little bit upset by those forces that are trying to keep us in the position that we are, the forces perhaps that are trying to take over agriculture. And I think that's when the consumer is really going to be exploited. If uh, corporation farming takes over, you can bet they're going to set their price. So I think that the consumer is unduly alarmed. But there's something else, too, going back to my opening statement about that $1 that the farmer is paid generating $7 of earned income. Look at the additional income. The people that are on part-time work or that are probably totally unemployed, what it can do for them. So I think the consumer has just as much to gain as the farmer does. And I think the consumer had probably be equally as much alarmed because if the family farm structure disappears, they have been the best supplier of food anywhere in the world. No other nation has a kind of a diet or as cheap a diet as the family farm is providing. So I think the consumer had better be concerned whether the, uh, the family farm moves out or not. I think you'd better watch another thing too because we're moving thousands of farmers off of the farm and we now become, then become consumers. And when we're added to the other side, 
and that gives the very few that's producing it a chance to get a heck of a price for it. Well, Consumers it, worry, all right. They better worry. Right. They, they might, better not worry so much about the family, about paying too much as long as the family farmer has it. Today, the things that corporations build are the highest of anything you can buy. It's higher than food. Well, you let those same corporations control the food in this nation, which they're getting a hold of, and then the consumer's really going to pay through the nose. I think there's another angle that I think we'd better bring in here, and that's the job situation. We have already eliminated within roughly the last 20 years uh, three and a half for three, over three million farm families, which right. represents five million workers at least. And uh, we're now now to 6% of the population, where some time ago, about the time we started with a collective bargaining program, we had 18%. Well, the unemployment figure is, is uh, not even as great as the number of people that have been brought in out of agriculture to put in there and compete for these jobs. I think this is your problem in the big cities, right. because a farmer is a specialist on his own farm, but when he leaves that farm, he's no specialist. Then he's competing for the very kind of jobs that perhaps these people that are in, unemployed in Louisville and Detroit in Los Angeles, you name it, that's where they go. And I think your problem comes right back here to what we've done in rural America. I think that we should give a little bit more attention here to the uh, the uh, livestock and, and uh, dairy programs that we haven't just barely <coughs> touched on here uh, briefly, but uh, I think this probably will follow soon after the grain program as far as your holding action is concerned. Is that right? My opinion is it won't be long after the grain goes in until we'll go into livestock. Probably these fellows could answer better than I on it, but I'm sure that the milk would be the last. I feel that way. Well, this decision, when that will be added, has been turned over to the National Board of Directors. And, of course, whenever we add livestock, and no question we will, or add milk, we will, it's going to be considering many factors, see, at which time it is most opportune for us to add that where we can have the greatest effect. There's uh, about six days, prob probably a little less than, at this time than six days meat supply on hand, so most certainly it will be effective. And then, of course, dairy we add still later when all of them are rolling together. We add, intend to add every commodity there is, no matter how small. Eventually, bring them in. It's This is our slogan. This is what we're going to do. No price, no production. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, is there any conceivable way that this could be done without holding it? Well, uh, I don't see how you're going to do it. You have to get an agreement to pay that. You have to shut it off. You wouldn't pay, let's say, whatever the price, and I would use a very modest figure, let's say $50 for that suit if you knew you could get it for 25 would you? Neither of these people. So when that merchant makes it emphatic that that's the price you're going to pay, then maybe they come to a realization they have to have it, and you'll pay it. So this is what we got to do. But there's one important thing that has not come out in all of this discussion that I think very few people understand that just holding it doesn't do it. This amounts to nothing if you're not backed up to feed that market with what, it'll, what it needs without breaking it back again. So really the entire basis of our program is to get our production sold on contract at least a year ahead at predetermined prices and then produce for that contract. So just holding won't do it. If we just held till we raised prices, everybody sold, it dropped back, you, you've gained nothing. You have to have a way to tie it down, and there's only one way you can do it, and that is to get signed contracts. And this is, this is really, uh, well, let's say uh, it's a powerful thing. A processor is going to have to sign for production. These are year in advance. If he doesn't get his production through contract, he's cut out for a year. He may be cut out for longer because our contracts, as we're issuing them now, provide that they're automatically renewable unless either party wants to discontinue. So any processor that through the holding action or when we're wielding our power doesn't get in, he could very well be out of the business. We don't want to put anybody out of business. We're offering it to all of them, but they're going to write their own ticket whether they're going to be there or not. We're going to sell it on contract, and that's that. This is the thing, Barney. Uh, we don't want you to get the idea that we're not trying something else. We're talking That's with processors all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, meat processors, dairy processors, all of them. We, we're continue bargaining and talking, but uh, the time is getting short here. Uh, too many farmers are leaving the farm. 
And the financial situation, is, as Mr. Finkson just barely touched on the start of this program, and it, it's serious. Agriculture's in a serious situation. The nation's in a serious right. situation. This but is the basic industry. They can certainly have our production, Barney, without a holding action, if we'll give us a price and a contract. They're the ones that's really holding. They're the ones that are saying whether we would really have a hold in action or not. Let me ask you one more question here before our time's all gone. That is this. Uh, do you have the, uh, the facilities, the manpower, the uh, financial uh, situation, as, uh, as it might be put, uh, to handle this kind of a job? Now, that's an obvious question, I'm sure, but... <laughs> you <laughs> bet we do. We, I, th well, I think we have the finest organizational setup and network that goes step through step down to where we can get in touch with any one member in a matter of hours or with the entire nation. I think it's the most terrific setup that uh, any organization has, and I think it would horrify some of the people that are fighting as if they knew how good this setup is. It is terrific. Now, uh, as for money, the manpower, and so forth, I don't think that there is an, another group, never has been anywhere that I know of, so dedicated, so determined as these people that we have in NFO. Thank you, gentlemen. Our guest today, Mr. Erhard Finkston, National Vice President of the NFO from Sergeant Bluff, Iowa. Mr. Glenn Utley here from Fort Branch, Indiana, National Director from the Hoosier State. Mr. George Stiles, State Chairman of Kentucky from Howardstown. This is Barney Arnold in Louisville, Kentucky, reporting for U.S. Farm Report. U.S. Farm Report has presented a look at agriculture and its effect on the economy with some of our nation's outstanding leaders. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at this time, for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers.